Your pardon, gentlemen, but I'm obliged to ask you to lighten the load up the hill. I think you'll have some slight difficulty in waking my companion. Sir? Sir? Wake up, if you be so kind, sir. No breakfast for me. I never take breakfast. Breakfast? <laughs> We're a long way from Dover yet, sir. Then what the devil's happening? We are mudbound, sir, and have been asked to lighten the load. Ah. Then it shall be lightened. A little help for hard-working horses is a worthy cause to one who detests work as much as I do. Indeed, sir. For a man of business like myself, it would be a matter of serious disability. Uh, no, I thank you. You, I presume, are not a man of business. Business? Lord love you, no, sir. Nothing nearly so respectable. But you need have no cause for alarm. If I were the robber you now suspect... Oh, no, no. Is it likely that I should be travelling unattended to the Assizes? Ah, the Assizes. You are a lion of the law. A lion, you flatter me, sir. I'm a jackal rendering service to a far better fed lion than I shall ever become. When one has the misfortune to be born without energy... Oh, there! What do you say, Tom? I say it's an horse coming up at a canter, Joe. I say horse coming up at a gallop, Tom. Gentlemen, in the King's name, both of you. <clears throat> it would be useless, I fear, to assure you that this is no partner of mine. Ho oh, there! You! You! Stand to rush your fire! Is that the Dover Mail? What do you want to know? Have you got a passenger, Mr. Jarvis Lorry? Uh, no, Carton. Sidney Carton is my name. Uh, I am Jarvis Lorry. Who wants me? Ah, it's Jerry, Master. Jerry Cruncher. I've got an urgent dispatch for you from Tea and Company. I know this messenger well, Guard. Uh, there's nothing to fear. I belong to Telson's Bank in London. I'm going to Paris on business. Wait, a crown for a drink. Hello, you. Yes? Come on a foot pace. Oh. If you're wearing a pistol, don't let me see you run. Go near it. Oh. Hello, Master. Wait at Dover for Mademoiselle. Oh. Recall to life. Big pardon, sir? That will serve for my answer. Recall to life. It's a blazing strange answer. Take back that message. They will know I received this as well as if I wrote myself. Good night, Jerry. Good night, sir. 
Henry, go to life. Good, yes. Come on. Good. That was indeed a blazing strange answer. I wish accommodation to be prepared also for a young lady. A Miss Manette. Yes, Mr. Lloyd. She will be arriving, I think, by the evening mail. I'll have rooms prepared. I thank you. And for you, sir? Nothing at all, apart from a bowl of punch. No bed, sir. I seldom keep awake long enough to reach my bed. Nor, alas, can I look forward to the pleasure of being joined by a young lady. <laughs> You are travelling home to France, Miss Manette? I'm going to Paris. Oh. But England has long been my home. You know this country well? I used to come here often before the war. It's a pleasure to be able to travel freely again. I fear this is my destination. Very rude. May I hope we shall meet again? Perhaps on the package ship tomorrow. It would be a pleasure to me, Mr. Darnay. There goes an evil minded blackguard if ever I saw one. Oh, Mr. Darnay? Oh, I thought he was a most agreeable gentleman. No, not your Mr. Darnley, miss. The other one. Though I might have known you'd have eyes for nobody else. Oh. There you are, Sidney. Have you done yet? There. Uh. Uh-huh. Yes. You've had to bottle, I perceive. Two tonight. I dined with our client. Or rather, I watched him dine. It's all one. Did I remark that you were very sound in the matter of those crown witnesses today? I'm always sound. I don't deny it. If to your talent you would only add purpose and energy. Pray spare me your favourite example of the man I might have been. You cannot blind yourself to the truth of it. You both began level at school. And even then I did your exercises for you and seldom my own. Whose fault was that? It was your fault, my dear Striver. It's been in your nature always to be driving and riving and pressing and shouldering to such a restless degree that I had no chance in my own life but in rust and repose. Is that the mail I hear? Yes. If I may point a moral, Sidney. Oh, hello. Hello. What a charming creature. Look, Sidney. Yeah. Most picturesque. How say you? Oh, come, Sidney, show some taste for once. Isn't she truly delightful? A pretty little doll. Sidney, if you were a fellow of any sensitiveness, any delicacy, oh, then I know you never mean half you say. A pretty little doll, indeed. I'm not sure, Miss Manette, how much you have learned already from the bank about this, uh, this affair. Uh, Miss Manette, when your father married the English lady who was your mother, I, on behalf of Telson's bank, was one of the trustees. Uh, your father, like many other French gentlemen, uh, left his affairs entirely in Telson's hands. Uh, please understand that I handle this matter as a man of business and 
Therefore, a man without sentiment, a mere machine. I'm still waiting for you to begin, sir. Yes, yes, I'm going to. But I find it very difficult to relate this story to you in such a way that you will be able to bear the hearing of it. I can bear anything, sir, rather than the insecurity in which you leave me at the moment. You speak collectedly. That's good. Now, this story is incomplete. It relies largely on some information we have received from a man named Defarge, who was formerly your father's servant. According to this man, Defarge, it appears that one night some 18 years ago, your father, Dr. Manette, was returning home late after attending a case in Paris when he received an urgent summons to the country home of a certain nobleman. a young peasant girl. The doctor found her suffering from a high fever of the brain. To keep her quiet, she had been gagged and tied with sashes and scarves. No thought was given as to whether she might suffocate. In fact, it would not have shortened her life by much if she had. For although Dr. Manette was able to ease her last hours, she died that same day from the violence she had suffered in body and mind. Nor was she the only victim of that young nobleman. In the stables was a boy of 17, her brother. He was dying from a sword wound. It was while Dr. Manette was attending him that he heard the full story from the servant, a man by the name of Gabel. They were a family of four, my master's tenants. Uh. Which means that nothing they possessed was their own, not even their bodies. The law allows a father no right to resist a claim on his daughter, but their father resisted. You're perhaps aware, Doctor, that these nobles have the right to harness a tenant to a cart and drive him like a horse or dog. Yeah, well, that's what happened to their father. This boy came here set in revenge with my master's a skillful swordsman. Doctor! Yes, yes, my poor fellow, I'm a doctor. Lie quiet now. Let me see to this. My sister. I've seen your sister. She is at peace now. My other sister. All alone. There's a second sister, only 15, God help her. Who told you to bring the doctor here? Um, Monsignor, the boy's suffering so much, I thought perhaps Monsignor... Get out! <sighs> doctor, you are not summoned here to listen to the babblings of this hind. You... You promise? This boy is dead. You may forget these serfs. I wish only to impress upon you, Doctor, that the things that you have seen and heard in this house are not to be spoken of. You would do well to mark that. But Dr. Manette had a conscience which would not allow him to heed that warning. He decided it was his duty to write a report of these events to the minister. This action he confided only to his servant, Defarge. I'm telling you this, Defarge, because I know what influence these nobles have. Should I be prevented from keeping my promise to that boy... It will be carried out. His last concern was for his younger sister. She is now alone and unprotected. I promised him I would do my best to save her from the sport of that gallant gentleman. My parents in our village... She would be safe there, I think. As safe as any child of a people may expect to be in this France of ours. Then tomorrow, Defarge, you will see to it. I must go to my patient. He went out of the door. He never came back. Murdered. No, Miss Manette. That was not his fate. What then was the manner of his death? Miss Manette. Miss Lucy, all this time we have had no word of what befell him after he passed through that door. We could only conjecture. We never dared to hope. And now, after 18 years, he has been found. He is alive. A greatly changed, no doubt. 
Because who would not be after all those years in that vilest of prisons? The Bastille. But he is alive and free. His old servant is taking care of him, that same Defarge. He later married the girl that he had protected, and they now keep a wine shop in Paris. It is there we are going tomorrow. Oh, Mr. Barney. Oh. Madam? You are not, Mr. Barney. <laughs> Mr. Carter. I'm so sorry. But at your service, nevertheless. I do beg your pardon, sir. I was under the impression that you were someone else. Would that I were. Providing always that uh, my awakening was graced by so charming a lady. Oh, come away. The man's not yet sober. Two such charming ladies. Ah, you're ready. Now, where is that porter? Porter! Coming, sir. I've been to observe the sea. Our crossing, I think, should be tolerable. Ah, at last. And the lady's baggage, please. Oh, the good fortune of some gentlemen. To be bound for France, with a fair lady for escort. We are travelling to Paris, sir, on a matter of business. I see. Then may I wish you an agreeable voyage? And you, sir, an agreeable business trip. <laughs> Goodbye, Percy. Have a good journey home. Yes. Yeah. Perhaps, perhaps I may offer you a small consolation, madam, for the disappointment of being left behind. Disappointment? If ever it was intended that I should cross salt water, do you suppose Providence would have cast my lot on an island? It's a strange prejudice. France has so much to commend her. Cask only. One only, Monsieur Defoe? Even that is more than they have the money to buy. Ah, the people will soon forget the very taste of wine. Ah, oh, many of them have forgotten it already. Aye, we taste nothing but black bread and death. Tiger's tasted blood. Tiger, poor crazed cattle. <laughs> Pardon, monsieur. Strangers are rare in this quarter. I think you're looking for me, Ernest Defarge. My name is Mr. Lorry. This is Miss Manette. Miss Lucy. My wife. You'll have forgotten me, I think. Follow me closely. I'm 
afraid of it. Of it? What? Of him. Of my father. Good day. Still hard at work, I see. Yes, sir. I'm working. We have a visitor today. Show Monsieur that shoe you were working at. Take it, Monsieur. Now, Tell Monsieur what kind of shoe it is, and the maker's name. It's a lady's shoe. And the maker's name? Uh, uh, 105 North Tower. Is that all the name you have? Hmm. One hundred and five North Tower. Monsieur Minette, do you remember nothing of me? Do you remember nothing of this man? Look at him. Look at me. Is there nothing rising in your mind? You've recognized him, monsieur? Yes. Just for a moment. I thought at first it was hopeless, but just for a moment... Shh. Back. What is this? You're the jailer's daughter. Who are you? Oh, my dear. Soon you shall know my name. All you need to understand now is that your agony is over. I have come to take you away. Away from France to peace and rest. Is Lucy at home? No, she's out walking with her father. How is Dr. Manette? Progressing. How else was such a doctor? He even talks of starting up in practice again. She's very devoted. Well, you better come in. Miss Pross, I have come here to ask certain questions of you as well as Miss Lucy. Of me? Do you recall a certain gentleman, a young Frenchman, who talked with Miss Lucy in the Dover Mail when you brought her to meet me? What if I do? He was respectable enough? Oh, quite. I agree. He happens to be a client of mine. Mr. Darney? Charles Darney. Now, do you also recall another passenger in the coach? Another foreigner? A man named Barsad? There was an evil-looking ruffian who never opened his ugly mouth. Seated beside Mr. Darney? Yes, he was. Good. That is the evidence we want. What's all this about? I'm afraid, Miss Pross, my client finds himself in grave trouble. He appears to be the victim of a pernicious plot, engineered, I am sure, by this man, Barsad. What do you want? The Monsieur Bassard here to see you, Monsignor. Ah. Send him in. Oh, 
father. I hate him. I know, child, I know. But as long as they have these rights, you know what it means to resist. If only Mr. Shaw would come back. And he's already in prison? Newgate. Awaiting his trial. Eating and sleeping with the scum of the streets. Excellent. A nobleman condemned to live with cattle. Hmm. My cousin will at last begin to appreciate the benefits of our own good French system. Ah, my dear friend. Miss Lucy. Dr. Manette. Miss Laurie. I'm very concerned to hear from Miss Pross about our friend in the Dover Mail. Charles Darnay. Yes. A bad business. He's to appear at the Old Bailey next week. What is the charge against him? Well, he is accused of being in possession of certain secret papers relating to naval matters, which he is said to have been taking with him to France. A spy? I don't believe it. Nor I, miss. I'm sure those papers were planted on his person without his knowledge. I have engaged a very able counsellor for his defence. A man named Stryber. Now, this gentleman wishes me to ask you if you would be willing to appear in court in Mr. Darnay's defense. Willingly. Good. Then I shall arrange for you to be escorted there by a messenger of the bank, a man who knows his way about the place. Swam ashore from the out. Be a long time before he oh. takes a bath again. No, look, my precious, me on you wet. And we haven't called jail fever already. Well, I'm getting you there as quick as I can. Might as well, might as well enjoy the fun while you're about. Oh, here, here's something to make you laugh. I don't know what he's done, but I'll bet Body he's... snatching. Oh. Yes. Here, this way, ladies, this way. Make way there, witnesses, witnesses. Make way. Yes. Follow me, ladies. Oh, oh no, we're too late. We'll have to wait till the prisoners go by. Which one's your treason, miss? Oh, good looking young fella. Shame, innit? What he look like soon? Hold on, come. What will they do to him? No, Lady Bird, no. What will they do to him if he's found guilty? Oh, well, seeing as how it's treason, he'd be drawn on hurdles. And I'll thank. Then he'll be taken down and sliced before his own face. Then his insides will be taken out and burnt while he looks on. His head will be chopped off and he'll be cut up into quarters. That's the sentence. It won't happen, Bryceus. It won't happen. We know he's innocent. Oh, for goodness sake, get us out of this place. Allow me. Oh, Mr. Carton. The same. A new ache here, of course, but in all other respects, the same. Follow me closely. Here, I'm looking after these ladies, sir. Heaven help them. That is what we call the Tyburn Mail. A vehicle in which my friends are showing me I shall one day have the pleasure of travelling. It's a false assumption. I live by crime in what is not only the easiest, but quite the safest way. This is where you go in. Mr. Lorry will join you as soon as he and friends Triver have completed their business. Mr. Carton, are you acquainted with our case? I am part of your case. Where the great Striver goes, there follows his jackal. I did not know. Mr. Carton. Please. You will do your best for Mr. Darnie. After such a request. I shall be doubly industrious on his behalf. Have you any motive, Mr. Barsad, apart from your sense of duty to your adopted country? Had you any motive at all for denouncing the prisoner? No, sir, none at all. And you were not actuated by any thought of gain? Certainly not. I did only what I thought was right. If I'm offered any reward, I shall decline to take it. Mr. Barsad, what first caused you to suspect the prisoner of being a spy? The way he was talking in the mail. You are sufficiently experienced in the ways of spies to detect one from his conversation? Perhaps I am a little 
sharper than most people? No doubt. So it was on account of the prisoner's conversation that you decided to get out and follow him when he alighted? It was. As a result of which you saw him handed certain papers by a certain mysterious stranger. I did. You had never seen these papers before. How could I? These papers had never previously been in your own possession? I don't know what you're talking about. I am suggesting that you acquired these papers for yourself sometime previously. And in the darkness of the coach, you transferred them to the person... It's a lie. Transferred them to the person of the man who now stands there in the dock, falsely accused to satisfy your own greed for enrichment. It's a lie, I say, a foul lie. Those papers were given to him in the dockyard, and I wasn't the only one that saw it. I've said already I've no wish for any reward. Miss Manette, we have heard some evidence as to your conversation with the prisoner in the Dover Mail. Is there anything of which we have not heard? It is impossible, sir, to recall every word. Impossible or inconvenient. I will endeavour to refresh your memory. Did you and the prisoner hold a discussion about the recent war with America? Yes, we did. Speak up, please. Now that I have recalled your mind to that event, perhaps you'll be able to tell us what was said about the war with America. The gentleman tried to explain to me... Do you mean the prisoner? Yes, my lord. Then say the prisoner. The, the, the prisoner tried to explain to me how that quarrel had arisen. He said... Yes? He said that as far as he could judge, it was a wrong and foolish one on the part of England. Silence! Anything else? He added, but, but there was no harm in the way he said this. It was said laughingly and to beguile the time. What did he add? He added that he thought perhaps George Washington might make as great a name in history as George III. <laughs> Thank you, Miss Manette. Oh. Officer, look to that young lady. Take her outside, see if she gets some fresh air. Have we your permission to continue, Mr. Cotton? Yes, my lord. And that, Mr. Clive, was the only time you ever saw the prisoner in the dockyard. Until today. I see the other party hand him the papers, secret like, and I says to myself, hello, I says. Yes, well, never mind what you said to yourself. Would it surprise you to learn that never in his life has the prisoner been anywhere near the dockyard in Dover? What a wicked lie. Look at him now and tell me if you're quite sure he was the man you saw. That's him, sir. You're absolutely certain that it was the prisoner? I am, sir. Have you ever seen anyone sufficiently like the prisoner for you to be mistaken? Not as I recall, sir. Look well upon this gentleman, my learned friend here. Stand up, Sidney. Let the witness see you. That's right. Remove your wig. Now look well again upon the prisoner. How say you? Do you detect some resemblance between these gentlemen? There is a likeness. When I now reveal that my learned friend was in fact in Dover on the day in question, would you not agree that you might very well have seen him there and mistaken him for the prisoner? Am I to take it, Mr. Stryver, that we shall next have to try Mr. Carton for treason? <laughs> I trust not, my lord. I seek only to illustrate my contention that the prisoner is no more memorable by virtue of his appearance than many others of his age. Thank you, Sidney. Uh, whatever the verdict, I must congratulate you, Mr. Stryver, on a most able defence. I have done my best, sir, and my best is as good as another man's, I believe. Is nobody going to say much better? <laughs> it was on the tip of my tongue. <laughs> now, Sidney, most impudent fellow, sir, to have for once, Julia. Oh, pardon me. Uh, Harrington, How is Miss Manette? better than being out of that court. 
The prisoner's distress to have caused you so much agitation. Did you see Mr. Dunny? He asked me to tell you that with his fervent apologies. Will you be seeing him again? I would so much like to ask his forgiveness. For neglecting to commit perjury? It's a grave failing in a witness. However, let us hope that you'll be able to express your own regrets to him. If I might. Uh, what does Mr. Darney expect? The worst. It's the wisest thing to expect. And the likeliest. The jury is coming back. Have you reached a verdict? We have. I'll say you. Do you find the prisoner guilty or not guilty? Not guilty. I am only just beginning to feel that I belong to this world again. It must be an immense satisfaction to you. As to me, the greatest desire I have is to forget that I belong to it. It has no good in it for me, except wine like this, nor I for it. So we're not much alike in that particular. Indeed, I begin to think we're not much alike in any particular, you and I. I'm glad the jury thought otherwise. I believe it was our likeness which turned the scale against Barsad. Mr. Barsad's a very dangerous fellow. You must be on your guard against him. Huh. I don't think he'll dare denounce me again. Nor anyone else. You've deprived him of a very good living. Then perhaps my ordeal was worthwhile. Don't take this too lightly, my friend. One acquittal usually means ruin for a common informer. Mr. Barsad will have to take his revenge quickly then. I leave in a few days for France. No doubt she'll soon be back. Does this country not hold a certain irresistible attraction for you? Why don't you call a health, Mr. Darnay? Why don't you give your toast? What toast? It's on the tip of your tongue. It ought to be. It must be. I'll swear it's there. Miss Manette, then. Miss Manette, then. That's a fair young lady to hand to her coach in the dark, Mr. Darnie. That's a fair young lady to be pitied by and wept for by. How does it feel? Is it worth being tried for one's life to be the object of so much sympathy and compassion, Mr. Darnay? You puzzle me, Mr. Carton. I probably owe my life to you. Yet it now becomes apparent that you have no liking at all for me. There is nothing in your dislike of me, I hope, to prevent my calling the reckoning. Nothing in life to call the whole reckoning? Certainly. Then drawer, bring me another bottle. Good night. Why should I like a man because he resembles me? There's nothing in me to like. I'm a disappointed drudge, sir. I care for no man on earth. And no man on earth cares for me.
has gone wrong. Uh, Pardon, Monsieur le Marquis. It's a child. Why is he making that abominable noise? Is it his child? It is a pity. Yes. He's dead! He's dead! You killed him! <laughs> it is quite extraordinary to me that you people cannot take better care of yourselves and of your children. Take that. He's dead! They killed him! I know. I saw it all. Be brave, my Gaspar. <laughs> Who threw that? You dogs. I would ride over all of you willingly and exterminate you from the earth. Drive on. Get up there. He is, fresh from his English jail. Charles. My cousin Charles, Monsieur Poulon. My respects, Monsieur. Your cousin has been telling me about you. A young man with strange views, eh? I think perhaps he has seen fit to moderate those views after his recent taste of the system in England. To me it's preposterous that this is a farming estate, yet there isn't one single family in the village out there which has even bread to eat tonight. Let them eat grass. That's what I always say. Let them eat grass. <laughs> well, Charles, judging from your recent conversation, you do not appear to have learnt very much from your little lesson. You speak, sir, as if my misadventure in England was not entirely chance. I warned you, my friend, I will not tolerate the spreading of disaffection among my tenants. You needn't concern yourself any more on that account. I am here only to collect my few small belongings, after which you'll see no more of me. You will forgive my idle curiosity, but how do you graciously intend to live? I must do what the noblest of my countrymen may have to do one day, work. In England, for instance? Yes, in England. With a name as hated as ours, France holds nothing for me. In England, I have another name. You may as well know now, my visit there was for the express purpose of planning my future life. We must not keep you from her a moment longer than necessary. Goodbye, sir. Goodbye. Here again. Who is? A man has been frightening Prossy for the past few weeks. He appears to haunt this street. A drunken man. He pretends to be drunk, but how do we know he really is drunk? Your father's a Frenchie. 
And these Frenchies with all their spies. <laughs> Let me look. Ah. Oh, I wanted to... Doctor, come quick. Yes, I'll come at once, Mr. Miller. You run on back, have some water on the boil. Right. I'll walk with him. Keep an eye on him. Just in case. That drunkard's gone. Don't wait up for me. <laughs> Good night, my darling. Good night, Miss Pross. Good night. Good night, Miss Pross. Doctor. I've been awaiting an opportunity to ask if I might come and see you in private. You're ill, Charles? Oh, no, sir. It's not my health. Ah. Then if it's what I think, you'd better come before I take surgery in the morning. Thank you, sir. I appreciate your understanding. If you ask me, he's hiding behind that tree. There, he moved. I knew it. He's very intoxicated. Why should a drunken man trouble to hide himself from the doctor, Miss? Answer me that. Stop! It made me a crack. I can't Come crush him. He's hurt. It's Mr. Carton. That'll cause more worry for us. He's hurt his head. Lucy. Beautiful Lucy. Mr. Carton, can you walk? Just a little way. Help me, Prossy. Oh. Leave him be, I say, disreputable sot. What's he up to here? That's what I want to know. Frightening us out of our wits and falling about all over our street. This way, Mr. Carton. Carefully. Down here. My humble pardon. I never intended to venture into this house. Prossy, will you be so good as to brew a pot of coffee? I'll not leave you alone with a man in his state. Nonsense. I wouldn't touch a hair of her head. Of course not. It's a very bad bruise. I must bathe it. And then some ointment. I'm not worthy of your kindness. Oh, it's not much to do. Mr. Carton, do you reside hereabouts? Miss Pross believes that she has frequently seen you. I come here every night. Every night? Here? To be near you. Get drunk. Must be near you. My pardon. I alarm you. There's no necessity to be alarmed. I love you. No harm to it. Never ask any return. I did not know. Why should you? It's ridiculous. Ah, beautiful girl. Sweet and beautiful. No good drunken waster. Do you know what? Head back. If you said return that man's love. Ridiculous. But if you said that, I wouldn't let you. No, I wouldn't let you. I'd only drag you down into misery and disgrace. Why am I telling you all this? I never meant to speak of it. Now that I know, is there not some way in which I may help you? None hopeless. <gasps> when I first saw you, I... I thought, just, just for a moment, I thought, I knew then. I tried not to think of it again. It's hopeless, too late to start again, to strive again. But you can't, you're young. Too late, a dream, all a dream ends in nothing. 
but a beautiful dream. You inspired it. Then have I no power for good with you? No power at all? Keep my secret. Never share it. Never forget it. You promise? That I promise. Willingly. It's all I need. All I ask. A small matter. When I die, one good thing to remember. My name, my faults, my miseries, all carried in your heart. Never shall I forget. Anything ever I could do for you. Keep me in your mind. Know that I would do it. Anything. Enough. Useless talk. I only distress you. Not worthy of such feeling. What's this? I have coffee to sober you. Who wants to be sober? Believe me, Doctor. It's the last thing I want ever to part you from her again. What I ask as a fellow exile is to be allowed to share this new life with you. Under the same roof, if Lucy will accept me. Lucy, of course, is the whole world to me. Without her, my return to life would mean nothing. But if you are essential to her happiness, and I truly believe you are, then I must give her to you, Charles. Dr. Manette, I swear you shall never have cause to regret your faith in me. You are no doubt eager to speak to her, and that I think is a patient I hear. Doctor, before I see her, there is one thing I should tell you. My name as an exile is, is not my true name. Oh, stop. I take you as I've come to know you, Charles. Tell me nothing more. But, sir... No, don't speak. You've been told what happened to me 20 years ago. If my future son-in-law is a past aristocrat, I prefer not to know it. Mr. Carton. Mr. Carton. Miss Manette, I'm here for a moment only because I'm not a man who takes much time over apologies. I find myself owing so many that it's easier to dispense with the whole business. Then pray dispense with it. I would. But for one thing. I know from uh, my hazy recollection that my behavior last night was unpardonable. And that doesn't greatly concern me, it often is. But you made me a certain promise, which I recall as clearly as if I'd never taken a glass of wine. It shall be respected. Thank you. That was my chief concern in coming here, lest you might simply have been humoring a drunken fool. Is it not often said that the truth emerges at such times? And truly said. Miss Minette, in all my drunken babbling, there was not one false word. That's what I wanted you to know. You may rest assured that I shall never refer to this again. Charles. Come in, Darnay. I was about to take my leave. Goodbye, Miss Minette. Goodbye, Mr. Carton. You're not your usual loving self today, Miss Pross. No invitations to coffee. Oh, wait. What is it now? Something I should have remembered to tell Mr. Darnay. My profoundest apologies. Mr. Carton, you shall be the first to hear our news. No, Charles. We are to be married. I congratulate you most sincerely. I'm sure that nobody could make you happy. For my part, I have a piece of news which will be your first wedding present. I came back simply to tell you that we have nothing further to fear from our friend Barsad. He is no longer with us. No longer with us? He's dead. He took a false step into the river. I passed his funeral on my way here. 
That's a relief indeed. Though he could have chosen a better moment to inform us. Are you sure this is the right one? Yeah, it's Barset Grave, all right. I saw him dead hit myself this very day. You said he was only a little one. Well, he must have fattened himself up since I see him at the Bailey. He didn't die of hunger, this one didn't. Well, come on, let's have it. <laughs> Much is that worth to them medical doctors? Eh? Hey? A slippery wiper, swindling honest tradesmen. First one I've met as didn't turn up at his own funeral. It's on account of his dirty trade. Lost his reputation when they acquitted the French in. Now he has to make a new start. Mm, let's put him back. Mm. Just like that bastard. Can't even be trusted to croak. <laughs> Madame. A glass of old cognac. They have taken Gaspar. Oh. Uh. Poor Gaspar. You are acquainted with Gaspar. I know him only as the assassin of the Marquis St. Evremont. This is my husband. Good day, Jacques. You deceive yourself, monsieur. My name is Ernest Defarge. Quite so. But isn't it the custom for those of certain sympathies to address one another as Jacques? You may address me as Jacques. Who sent you here to spy on us? Madam, whatever gave you such a preposterous idea? No one but a spy of the aristocrats would dare to speak to us like that. Wouldn't a far-sighted person do so? One who sees which way the wind is blowing. What wind, monsieur? You know very well, Jacques. The first puff of that wind swept the Marquis St. Evremont to his grave. Uh, and speaking of Evremont, I think you'll be interested to have news of his cousin, the new Marquis. He's settled in England, we know that. Yes, and getting married. Did you know that too? You should have, for you're acquainted with his bride-to-be. To whom do you refer? Why, to Miss Manette. Didn't she call here once to claim her father? The poor, oppressed doctor. You see, I make it my business to find out these things. I could be a very useful comrade, Jacques. Never before have I unpacked for a man. Oh, cheer up, Miss Pross. Honeymoons go all too quickly. We shall soon have them back with us. Have the guests all gone? Mr. Carton is still here. He found it necessary to take a little nap. I'm sure he did. Why our ladybird ever wanted to invite that tosspot to a wedding, I shall never understand. <laughs> Doc! Oh, Mr. Carton! Oh, Doctor, what is it? Mr. Carton! Mr. Carton! Oh, come quick here, the doctor. To me, it seems almost a symbol. I wonder, are they having it out there? In France, you mean? 
There's a storm coming to them, surely enough. They weather by the hand of nature. Such a storm, it's likely to be. But if ever the rulers of a nation invite... Oh, good gracious, I've been asleep. And look at the hour. What sort of a host you must think me. You've not stepped alone, Doctor. I'm afraid it's this excellent wine of yours. Half undressed. I'm truly most ashamed. I, uh, I'm afraid we all partook a little too freely. Not you, Mr. Norrie. Worse than either of us, Doctor. He lay back in that chair and snored loud enough to shame the thunder. I, I, I don't seem to remember. Nor I. It's a shocking state of affairs. Leaving the heavens to awake us. This is a storm indeed. Enough to bring the dead out of their graves. Jack 15! It is a cell number. 
Show it me! Follow, follow me. Come on! We've got old Foulon. Foulon? Foulon? He who told us to eat grass. He's eating grass now in the very place we last met him. Hey, come citizen, let's get down there. Come on. Come on. Come on. Wait a little longer before you must leave for France. Impossible, miss. If you could see the chaos in our Paris office. Now it's spread to all the countryside. There'll be danger in every mile beyond Calais. I think they'll be too busy with their own affairs to interfere with an old fellow like me. I'm taking Jerry Cruncher with me as a bodyguard. I wish we could make you change your mind. No, I've delayed this visit too long already. Even as I'm talking to you, Paris may be afire or sacked. Our customers' property burnt or plundered. You cannot save it. Now, maybe not, Charles. But in a tidy business way, I can see that all changes of assets are truly recorded. If there's anything of yours that I may look to... There is nothing of mine in France. But tell me only what the charge is. Acting for an immigrant. What I have done for my new master was in your interests. But let me only write to him. Father! Oh, not my daughter. Hold me responsible if you must. But what has she done? What have any of these others father, done? Father, father, don't let them take me. Oh, don't blame her. What have these others done? What have any of these others done? You it! Well, we starve! Hello, Carton. I'm afraid Lucy's out. She and the doctor. I made sure they would be out before I came here to deliver this. I was visiting the bank this morning and saw it awaiting you in the rack. How did you know it was for me? Where did you get that? You were careless enough to have it still among your possession. How did you come by it? I stole it. I went to your room the night that Dr. Manette was taken sick. Curiosity impelled me to trace its noble origin. And when I saw the same name on that letter and identified you as a French nobleman, I was prepared to discover some episode in your past, some covered up disgrace, which would explain your rebirth as Charles Darnay. Knowing your dislike of me, I'm sure you would have found it most welcome. I was truly thinking more of Lucy. Then allow me to reassure you. I disclaim my title, and with it my estate, solely because the name on this letter is one of the most hated names in France. Before asking Lucy to marry me, I decided to renounce it completely, wash my hands of it. How simple it all sounds. Far simpler than I'd imagined. Goodbye to France. Farewell to all responsibility. Would you like me to burn that letter? I see now that you have no cause to read it. It comes from Gabelle, the man I left in charge of my estate. I sent him instructions long ago to give the people their freedom. Devil take it! You were right to chide me. Gabelle and his daughter have been imprisoned, taken to Paris and lodged in La Force. He fears for their lives. Ah! 
I have been selfish. I should have gone back to France where my cousin died. Worked out and supervised all I meant to do. Carton. Carton, I'd be obliged if you'd say nothing to Lucy of this. She would only share my own concern about it, and she's not in a condition at this time to be worried. We... we haven't voiced it abroad yet. Our child is due in the spring. I see. In view of that, I hope you won't contemplate doing anything foolish. You must leave me to make my own decision. Lucy. Oh, Sydney, forgive me for disturbing you at your work. Oh, my work? But you did once say if there was anything you could do for me. Anne meant it. Charles has gone to France. You'll see why. Some servants are in danger. Sidney, I must go to him. But I understand I need a permit. I would have gone to Mr. Lorry, but unfortunately he's in Paris already. Lucy, it'd be most unwise for you to go to France at a time like this. Sidney, I must. You may not know, but Charles's family were aristocrats. Yes, I knew. You knew? Mm -hmm. Then you will understand. But you can't. Sidney, I must. I know he's in danger. I must go to him. Has he arrived in Paris by himself? He did. Bring him to me. Yes, sir. Is Citizen Defarge here? Yes. Another from the list supplied by your excellent wife, Charles Darnay, or as he would prefer not to be known, the Marquis saint avermont Darnay? But I thought he was lost to us, living in England. Your age, Evermond. My name is Dane. Your age, Evermond. 27. Married, Evermond? Yes. Where is your wife? In England. Without doubt. You're consigned, Evermond, to the prison of La Fosse. Just heaven. Under what law? For what offence? We have new laws, Evermond, and new offences since you were here. I invite you to observe that I have come here voluntarily in response to this written appeal of a fellow countryman. That's no interest of mine. I surely have the right to be heard. Immigrants have no rights, Evermond. There is a new decree confiscating their property. But I, I have no property. And condemning to death all who return. Take him away, Defarge. Monsieur Charles. Marie. It's good to see a friend. Though I wish it was somewhere else. Tell me, your father? Ah, I'm too late. Yesterday, I asked to be tried with him, but they wouldn't listen. Thank God, at least for that. My cause is yours, Marie. And it's a good cause. We'll go out free together. You do not know them, Monsieur Charles. What did he ever do except be kind? Oh, I loved him so. Mm -hmm. 
Gaudium et Epitia, exultavum Gaudium et Epitia, Averti Patiam Tuam et Peccatis Mei, et Omnes Niquitatis Mea Tele. Yes, that's a more life. Why, yes. Well, my wife. A pleasing day, eh? A beautiful day. Forty-seven heads. <laughs> I've got good news for you. Yes? Come here. What? Come. You hey. sit down. The first name on your register. Here in Paris. Evremont? I took it myself to La Fosse. At last. Evremont. Is he alone? His wife is still in England. He asked me to communicate with her father. I refused. You refused? But why? That information is the one certain way of bringing her here. Dr. Manette has surely suffered enough. I'm not concerned with the doctor. It's his daughter. She's an Evermore now. But if she is to be punished for her marriage, it will mean fresh anguish for him. Anguish? You talk to me of anguish. What is one daughter beside a father, brother, sister, all dead at the hand of that accursed family? She is not of their blood. He's married six months. What if there's a child on the way? An Evremond. Now listen. I've had this family a long time on my register for extermination to the last of the line. Isn't that so? It is so and tell wind and fire where to stop. But don't tell me. Alexander Manette? Yes. French, physician? Good. Lucy Darney, French. This is my daughter. Emily Pross. English. Yes, and proud of it. Is this your first visit to France? It is, and I hope my last. Prossy. She's my companion. Oh. Sooner yours than mine. Where is the fourth passenger? Hey! Wake up! Come on, wake up. Patience, my good citizen, patience. It's bad enough to rob a man of his dream. Don't put your hands on me. I am no aristocrat. That's very true. Sidney Carton, advocate. English. What brings you to France? Your wines, my good citizen. What else? Proceed. It's a convenient spot for an armory. Between the two big prisons. Well, no, no, we dare not protest. There's blood on them blades. It's too horrible to watch. Yeah, it is, isn't it? I'm like you, master. Scares me to the marrow, but uh, I just have to gotta keep on looking. Uh, was you expecting visitors? No. God help them, whoever they are. It's Dr. Manette. This is a prisoner from the Bastille. It's true, friends. 18 years oh. in the Bastille. Can 
Can these be the people I used to know? Uh, brutality, I fear, only leads now to more brutality and worse. They can't even wait now for their prisoners to be tried. Oh, don't heed it, my precious. What would a banker know about it? What have I said? Charles Darnay is a prisoner in La Force. Oh, may heaven forgive me. We've searched everywhere he might have been. We heard this news but an hour ago. Dr. Manette hopes to plead for him at the tribunal. That's why we've come here. Well, then all will surely be well, judging by the esteem they show for him. If we're still in time. I gave my father, sir, was only for the good of our neighbors. He was a kind man. He did his very best for them. Your father was executed as an enemy of the people. Do you dare to impugn the justice of this tribunal? I say you. Guilty. Death. Within four and twenty hours. Charles Evermont called Darnay. I knew Darnay was not his true name. Charles Evermont called Darnay. You are accused as an emigrant whose life is forfeit to the Republic under the decree that banishes all emigrants on pain of death. Enemy of the Republic! Death! What have you to say, emigrant? I submit that I am not an emigrant. I left this country more than a year ago to live by my own industry in England sooner than live on the industry of the overladen people of France. Have you any proof of this? Yes, I have. The truth of my statement will be confirmed by Dr. Manette, the good physician who sits there. I am Alexander Manette. Prisoner for 18 years in the Bastille. I was released nearly two years ago and settled in England. The accused was one of the first friends I made there. He has been faithful and devoted to my daughter and myself in our exile. And she was a witness in his favor when he was tried for his life by the aristocratic English government as the foe of that country and friend of the United States. You have heard enough. We find the accused not guilty. Stop! Hold the accused. You have a further charge? The accused is a denounced enemy of the Republic. An aristocrat. One of a family of tyrants. Denounced secretly or openly? Openly, Mr. President. By whom? Alexander Manette. Physician. President, I indignantly protest. That is a foul and wicked lie. The accused is the husband of my daughter. Who would believe that I could denounce my own son-in-law? They will believe it when this document is read. What is this document? President, I knew this Bastille prisoner, Alexander Manette, had been confined in a cell known as 105 North Tower. On the day the Bastille was taken, I examined that cell. Hidden in it, I found that document. It bears the writing of Dr. Manette, which I know well. I ask that it now be read. I, Alexander Manette, unfortunate physician, native of Beauvais and afterwards resident in Paris, write this melancholy paper in my doleful cell in the Bastille during the last months of the tenth year of my captivity. 
I write from the fear that soon my failing memory will erase from my mind the events I wish to record, lest the crimes of my oppressors be forever buried. Here he goes. Then we have him. Are you sure I'm right? If that ain't Bow said, I'll let me it took off. But what's he worth to us? And that remains to be seen. <laughs> Mr. Barsad, you remember me? You mistake me for somebody else, monsieur. My name is Solomon, Jean Solomon. I beg your pardon, that was tactless. You would appear to have become a person of some importance, Mr. Solomon. May I venture to ask what function you perform? I have certain duties here with regard to the interrogation of prisoners. I might have guessed it. A spy. A secret informer. Just like our old friend Bass. I've, I've told you that's not my name. Who said it was? There was a man of that name who somewhat resembled me but he's been dead and buried these past 18 months. It is possible, Mr. Solomon, that I might have to ask you a favor. Some slight recompense for my tact in forgetting certain particulars of your past. Don't you dare to threaten me, Mr. Carton. You remember my name, I am flattered. I'd have you know that I stand in high regard here amongst the people who count. Excellent, that makes your friendship all the more valuable. Regard it as a game of cards. The stake that I resolved to play for in case the worst happens, is a friend among the people who count. And the friend I propose to win, Mr. Solomon, is you. You'll have to hold a good hand, Mr. Carton. I do. Firstly, I'm an Englishman with no axe to grind in France, and no cause to represent myself under another name. That's a very good card. My second one. Mr. Solomon, now in the employ of the Republican French government, was formerly Mr. Barsad, in the employ of the aristocratic English government, enemy of France and freedom. That's an even better card. You think I should play the ace, Jerry? You play it, Mr. Carton. Then fill up our friend's glass and let the ace be played quietly. That same Mr. Barsad was at one time in the employ of no lesser personage than the late Marquis saint Evremont. Love of heaven, be quiet. I think Mr. Solomon requires his cognac, Jerry. What do you want from me? Nothing at all, I hope. That will be determined by events now in progress. I was brought to my living grave here in the Bastille with only one remaining hope, that my servant, Defarge, may have been successful in saving the poor, hapless girl who alone was left of the family exterminated by that young nobleman. He and his descendants, to the last of their race, do I now denounce Dad! to the time... Dad! 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 I denounce them to heaven oh, and to no. earth. <laughs> this is a tragic and frightful testimony indeed. But in the name of justice, I must observe that Dr. Manette either by reason of his failing memory or because it was unknown to him, makes no mention therein of the name of this nobleman he has denounced. I will name him. And no one in the world has better cause. For I was that young girl who was the last one left alive in that family. It was I who was rescued by Defarge and brought up in the village by the fishermen. That father, driven to death in the shaft, was my father. That mortally wounded boy in the stables was my brother. And that poor, outraged peasant girl, my sister. Do you think I haven't cursed again and again the name of that vile monster? He was the cousin of the accused, the Marquis saint Evremont. <laughs> hey! I tell you once and for all, the thing's impossible. No prisoner ever yet escaped from La Force. Who spoke of an escape? Did you, Jerry? 
Not me, Mr. Carton. Let's hope there won't be no need for an escape. Amen. So you see, Mr. Sullivan, we all three sit here around this table, hoping there'll be no cause to trouble you. Is there a verdict in the Evermore trial? Guilty! Yes, in 24 hours! <laughs> It seems, Mr. Solomon, that I shall have to ask you that favor. What happened? Oh, my precious. Oh, Prosy. My father is ill. The shock. If he could only regain the power of speech. He must have some sleep. Now, after he's slept, perhaps. You must rest now. Come. Come. It's happened again. I feared it when that vile woman denounced the family of Evermond. The family? Well, you heard it yourself. I wasn't there at the end. You weren't there? I heard the verdict from the rabble in a wine shop. You're disgusted. Forget about me, I'm of no importance. Did you say the whole family was denounced? To the last of the race. You realize, I suppose, the danger in which this puts Lucy? Oh, thank God, her relationship is by marriage only. Lucy is carrying a child in every moment. He's gone to sleep. Almost at once. Child. It's the best thing we could wish. Sydney, you're an advocate. You must know. There must be some form of appeal, some chance of a reprieve. I think perhaps there may be. Do you? Do you really believe that? We shall do all that's humanly possible. Better get a little sleep yourself now. He wouldn't want you to fret and worry. No. I think perhaps I may sleep. Now. Lucy. God bless you. How can you be so unkind, so heartless? You know as well as I do. There isn't a chance of stopping this execution. None whatever. Then why raise the poor child's hopes? Mr. Laurie, you could waste all night taking me to task and we haven't that much time. Will you please attend to everything I have to say? Ask me no questions and give me the promise which I shall exact from you. I have a reason. You understand now that Lucy is in grave danger. It depends upon you and you entirely to save her. Heaven grant that I may pardon. But how? I shall tell you how. I don't think I could depend upon a better man. Early tomorrow, have a coach and horses ready for a rapid journey to the sea coast. Then it's been starting trim at 10 o'clock. It shall be done. Tell Lucy tonight what you know of the danger to her child. Say that her father's in danger too. Press upon her the urgency of leaving Paris at that hour. Tell... Tell her... It was her husband's last arrangement. Tell her that more depends on all this than she dare believe or hope. I will. See Lucy and her father into a coach out here in the courtyard. Take your place with them. The moment I come to you, take me in and drive away. I may not be in a condition to assist you. Don't look at me like that. For once in my life, I am quite sober and deadly earnest. Promise me, solemnly, that nothing, nothing will make you change my instructions. I promise. Here, then, are my papers. Take them and keep them with the rest. You may need them tonight. It's dangerous to be abroad in Paris without papers. You are not to question my instructions. Remember your promise. I shall remember it. I hope to do my part faithfully. I hope to do mine.
If only the poor darling can sleep. Ah, that one's a lot of good at a time like this. Going out now to get drunk, I suppose. Now, Miss Pross, no. Not this time. The bravest and best of us all. What do you want? Who is this? He's a friend of uh, Evremont. He's English. Evremont. Poor old Evremont. He's got permission to say goodbye to him. Looks as if he has been making a night of it. Trying to keep his courage up. Remember. A few minutes only. Carter! Of all people on earth, you least expected to see me. I cannot believe it to be you. You're not a prisoner. No, I'm accidentally possessed of a power over one of your guards here. Danny, I come from your wife. You must do everything I ask without question. Put on this coat. Carter, there is no escaping from this place. It can't be done. You'll only die with me. No, no, it's madness. It would be madness if I asked you to escape, but do I? If I ask you to pass that door, tell me that I'm mad and refuse me. Carton, dear Carton, whatever you have in mind, I implore you not to add your death to mine. You mistrust me. Take that pen, sit down, and write as I dictate. But hurry, my friend, hurry. Write exactly as I speak. I knew it was not in your nature to forget the words which passed between us long ago. I am thankful that the time has come when I may Truly, prove them. What vapor is that? Vapor? I'm conscious of nothing. Right on. That I do is no subject for regret or grief. Be no grief. Ah, Therese, I was just coming for you. I saw you here. I have some business to do before I go to the guillotine today. But today is your day of days. I shall be there for the 23rd head. Ah, Evermore. That'll bring the loudest shouts. What I have to say is not for the ears of my husband. Huh? Defarge is a good enough Republican, but he has weaknesses. He's weak enough to relent towards a certain doctor and his daughter. The wife of every man. She will be at home now, waiting the moment of his death. She will be mourning and grieving. Yes, and it's an offence to mourn for an aristocrat. She will be in a state of mind to speak against the justice of the Republic. I shall be there to hear. Ah, ha, ha, my cherished. What a splendid woman this is. Take this. Keep my usual place for me. But you won't be late. I shall be there when his turn comes. <laughs> Your 
You see? Is your hazard so very great? My hazard, Mr. Carton, is whether you remain true to your bargain. I shall remain true to it. To the very end. Can any man keep to a bargain like that? Have no fear. I shall soon be out of harm's way. And so, please God, will they. My coach is still outside. Yes, it was a minute. Get some assistance. Have him taken to it. Hurry, man, hurry. Mr. Carton. Tell them to take him to Tilson's bank. He has friends there. Hey, you there. Goodbye, old Sydney. Hey, you there. Gentleman needs a bit more help this time. <laughs> Out like a light. I'm not surprised the lady had when he came in. <laughs> I wish I were rich enough to stick like this one. Have your papers all right? And Jerry's? Yes, don't bother about us. We can look after ourselves. You and Jerry will follow in the second coach. Now go and send Miss Lucy out immediately. The time. It's so near. You must go quickly. Has Mr. Carton returned? Come this minute. Wait! Travelers to England. Mm. Jarvis Lorry, banker, English. That's me. Alexander Manette. Alexander Manette. Alexander Manette. Uh, can, can it be the same? Lucy Darnay. Of course, his daughter, the wife of Evermond. That is so. Evermond has an assignation elsewhere. Sidney Carton, advocate, English. <laughs> it's proving difficult to waken our friend. I recall this Englishman, the one that even a revolution couldn't keep from our wines. <laughs> Let him dream on. Twenty 
Président Gabel. 22 Duvernois. 23 Evremont. 24 Garneau. 25 Carnevesh. Monsieur Charles. Monsieur Charles. I thought you were Citizen Evremont. And who shall say I'm not? You. Are you dying for him? And another. May I hold your hand, stranger? Your eyes on me and mind nothing else. I mind nothing while I'm with you. I shall mind nothing when I go. If they are quick. They will be quick. Suddenly, I want to weep, but I must hold my tears in check, lest they think it is myself I weep for. And who would weep for Sidney Carton? A little time ago, 
none in all the world. But somebody will weep for me now. And that knowledge redeems a worthless life. Worthless, but for this final moment, which makes it all worthwhile. It is a far, far better thing I do than I have ever done. It is a far, far better rest I go to than I have ever known.